uh, to introduce uh, Adesola Sanuzi, who is the first Applied Social Media Lab Project Fellow um, and is somebody I've been lucky enough to know for uh, quite a few years now. Um, Adesola is currently serving as a uh, leader of strategic initiatives at NALA, an African financial technology firm enabling cross-border payments. Um, previously, she was a product leader and chief of staff at Okra, a business-to-business -business, uh, open banking fintech based in Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, prior to that, I got to know Adesola during her time at Google, where she was a product manager both in the ads business, and then we got to work together for a while at a special little group within Google called Jigsaw that was focused on building technology to help make people safer from various forms of digital conflict, Repre things like repressive censorship, state-sponsored disinformation, and in particular, bringing us to where we are now, organized harassment. Uh, Adesola was the product manager leading an amazing project called Harassment Manager at Jigsaw and has maintained her passion and enthusiasm uh, for online safety and making people safer. She's done a project with the ASML on uh, ways to combat the harassment of journalists online. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adesola to share what she's been working on and some ideas. Um, we will be doing Q&A at the end in a discussion section. Please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A section of Zoom uh, while Adesola is speaking, and then folks will help uh, kind of elevate the questions and drive the discussion once Adesola is done with the presentation portion. But um, Adesola, again, thank you for doing this, and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan, uh, for the lovely intro. Uh, thank you, everyone who is attending. Um, excited to kind of share some of the work that I've been doing with ASML. Um, and hopefully, I hope we can just garner some discussion and hopefully um, just inspire more work in the area generally. All right. So I think uh, Jonathan already went through my background a bit, but I will give a little bit more just in terms of me. Um, so I'm Nigerian American, um, previously uh, studied at Harvard, uh, studying computer science and then a minor in economics. Um, after that, as Jonathan mentioned, I spent some time at Google, um, did some time in ads, but I think the more the work I was more passionate about, don't tell my ads folks, is um, the work that I did at Jigsaw, uh, where we got to sort of use technology to combat all forms of digital threats. Um, and during my time at Jigsaw, I had the opportunity to specifically lead the anti-harassment vertical. Um, and I actually feel like there are some folks from my Jigsaw days on this webinar. So thank you so much for joining. Um, after my time at Google, I kind of took a pivot um, and kind of worked on some other passions near and dear to me, which is doing work um, specifically on the African continent. Um, and so I joined a fintech startup at the time called Okra, uh, where they were doing sort of B2B open banking. So for those familiar with the fintech world, a lot of infrastructure and data, data work there. Um, had the opportunity to do product work as well as then serve as the chief of staff. Um, and then kind of during my, in between my time at Okra and what I'm doing now, I had the amazing opportunity to team up with Jonathan again and do some work with the Applied Social Media Lab. Um, and so we'll be sharing a lot of that work today. Um, and then as Jonathan mentioned, now I'm at a FinTech startup called Nala, uh, where I lead strategic initiatives. And it's a startup focused on cross-border payments, uh, specifically both for individuals and businesses. So to deep dive a little bit into the work that I've done specifically in the anti-harassment space, um, while I was at Jigsaw, did a number of efforts that touched on um, online harassment generally and specifically around journalists. Um, some of this involved Perspective API, uh, which is a free API uh, that is hosted uh, by Jigsaw that allows for the detection of toxic language online. Uh, so it's used by a lot of online platforms and their different moderation schemes to keep their online community safer. Um, a notable example there is uh, New York Times, for example, uses Perspective um, as well as some other API to sort of moderate the content that flows through their sites. 
um, was involved in a number of different research efforts as well, thinking through what are other technical solutions to sort of combat harassment, um, also thinking about solutions that can not only empower uh, targets of harassment, but thinking about solutions that are platform specific or even kind of online user specific. So thinking about folks that are just online every day, how can we also empower them through technology to keep the uh, online forum safer? Um, and then the last bit there was did a lot of work on Harassment Manager, uh, which is now an open source tool um, that uh, allows targets of harassment to better document and report the harassment they receive. Um, so that was a lot of the work that I did at Jigsaw. Um, so I was so excited for the opportunity to kind of jump back into the space again with ASML. Um, and so what I will be talking through today is the action plan that I put together, um, working with a number of folks in the ASML community, as well as some of the previous research that had been done, um, and thinking through what are some of the interventions and things that we can do to sort of continue the important work of combating journalistic um, harassment online. So with that, that's a bit on me. So I will kind of just jump in. So for those that are not familiar with the space, just gonna set a little bit of context for sort of why this problem is so important, um, kind of what's happening right now, what are some of the challenges um, and what are maybe some of the avenues for further work. Um, and then I will spend the bulk of my time talking through specific interventions that I propose, um, you know, taking into account research, taking into account a number of conversations within folks in the community and broader, um, taking into account some conversations with different journalists who have, you know, faced this problem firsthand. Um, and some of these interventions are in a hope to inspire work, not only within ASML, but hopefully um, inspire broader work, broader efforts, and to also support the ongoing efforts. I do want to mention a big thing that there is a ton of work happening in this space and a lot of people doing great work in this space. Um, so I hope some of the things I talk about today also amplify further efforts and raise sort of awareness for things that are happening already. All right, so to jump in, um, kind of anchoring this stat as just something for all of us to reflect on. 73% uh, of women journalists have experienced online harassment. And that is a very staggering number if you think about the amount of female journalists we have. Um, and when you break down different intersectional populations, that number gets even more severe. Um, and today there's not enough attention, support, and funding. I think anyone who has worked in this space will agree with, me, agree with me that there's a lot more that can be done in terms of just attention, more support, and definitely just more funding from a, from a wide standpoint. Um, Jenner, there is no magic wand solution. I think that will come to no, a, that won't be a surprise for anyone. Um, there is no way to just, you know, wave a magic wand, have one technical solution, and all this goes away. Um, so you'll notice kind of throughout my presentation today and in further things that may be shared, I'm very deliberate about saying interventions and not necessarily solutions. Um, past interventions have not had widespread effectiveness. So as I mentioned, there's been a ton of work going on in this space and the interventions that currently exist have not kind of been at the point at which the problem is happening, right? So there's a lot more needed um, and a lot more people being affected than what the current interventions are touching today. And some of that, as I mentioned, is the awareness, is the support, is the funding. Um, and so I think a big conclusion that we can all come to is that working in this space and really addressing the problem of journalist harassment online will really require a lot of multiple and diverse interventions that over time can mitigate the impact and the spread. And so looking at the different interventions and kind of deep diving into the space, it's really important to not just kind of take into account the breadth of work that's being done, but also to take into account the lifespan of online harassment. So specifically, how is it sort of happening um, on different online platforms and also kind of think through the affected groups. Um, I think this will help really set context for a lot of the interventions that I will be talking about today. So quickly to just touch on the lifespan, um, Typically what happens is a journalist will release some sort of work online. Um, there will be some sort of inciting incident that raises awareness to that particular work. Um, so an example could be for, uh, for instance, you know, uh, the work is then shared by a very prominent figure, for example. Um, most times the inciting incident is usually attacking the work or maybe attacking the journalist, unfortunately, and that inciting incident 
causes a bit of a dogpiling effect where a lot of other online users kind of come and either attack the piece of work or attack the journalists often themselves. Um, and then, of course, that has a chilling effect personally on the journalist that was sort of faced this dogpiling incident generally. And, you know, that can come with so many adverse effects of being targeted online. It can also lead to physical forms of violence or physical threats as well. Um, so very, very difficult and sort of painful lifespan, but important to take into account as we think about the interventions that can help to combat the problem. Um, then in terms of sort of the affected groups, uh, we have the perpetrators. And so these are oftentimes just online users that initiate harassment and can initiate the dog piling when they are responding to a piece of work that oftentimes they don't agree with. Um, then you have the journalists themselves, and these are the targets of harassment normally, and oftentimes face the greatest burden to, of course, deal with the negative consequences, but also to protect themselves. Then we have the online platforms that are oftentimes the technology companies where a lot of this harassment is happening. So they're sort of hosting these online spaces where we see a lot of the harassment taking place. And so you can just think about some of the popular, you know, social media sites um, and different forums online where a lot of this is taking place. Um, and then of course they're supporting bodies. So there's nonprofits and newsrooms. Um, and oftentimes they are sort of existing groups that are hopefully helping to support journalists where they can um, or oftentimes doing sort of independent work to combat online harassment in this space. So with some of that context, the goal for sort of the action plan that I put together and a lot of what I'll be sharing today was really thinking about how do we reduce journalist harassment online um, by combining different approaches across different time horizons. So um, as the context I said, it was really important not just to think about um, interventions that only touch on a specific part of the lifespan or only touch on specific affected groups. I think oftentimes there is sort of a tendency to focus on, you know, maybe just an inciting incident or to only focus on the journalists themselves and putting the complete burden and onus on them to combat this problem. So really thinking this goal, the goal I had in doing this work was to make sure that we're thinking through interventions that touch on the different sort of ways that we can combat this issue at a broader scale. Um, and how that kind of laddered into sub goals was first off just, you know, how can we provide increased resources, tools, and dialogue um, that not just only empower individuals, but also help online platforms better manage and mitigate this harassment. Um, and then of course, how do we get to the systemic causes, right? We know that there's a lot of hate, there's a lot of strong opinions, right? We, we often have very, for example, very divisive political climates. Um, so how do we get to the systemic causes of maybe what is causing people to, you know, spew that hate in online forms in ways that they don't in, in, in person forms? Um, so those are some of the things I was thinking about and some of the goals that I anchored a lot of the work around in proposing interventions. Um, so without spending too much time on just creating context, I do want to go into some of the specific interventions that I proposed in the action plan, and I hope will inspire more work or amplify uh, past work. Awesome. So just to set a little bit of context around each of the interventions themselves, I sort of came up with an assessment rubric, right? Um, one thing that I wanted to make sure was that these interventions could be potentially actioned on, uh, whether that's occurring through ASML or with other bodies or even in collaboration with other institutions that are doing some of this work. So coming up with this assessment rubric was really a way for us to sort of grade these interventions and to understand kind of how we can sort of pit them against each other and really fight for the funding, the resources um, that are required to roll out a lot of these things out. So in terms of the categories, uh, just to briefly go into this, um, first category was just potential for impact. Um, we just wanted to make sure that these were sort of interventions that could be high impact that would touch a lot of people and would really sort of, you know, um, touch as many journalists as possible and who really uh, touch on a very expansive way to solve the problem. Uh, then we talked, uh, then the next sort of category was looking at feasibility. So how easy is it to potentially implement this intervention? Uh, then looking at resource requirements. So not just sort of time, but also thinking about more so the cost 
you know, what are the funding requirements? Are there a lot of technical hands needed? Are there a lot of man labor needed to potentially push forth some of these interventions? Uh, then we looked at time to implement. So, you know, how long would be potentially required? Is this something that would take years? Is this something that could be done in months? Um, then there was also a focus on uh, scalability. So is this something that can easily scale to a broad range of people uh, such that it would touch a ton of journalists around the world or around different parts of the United States? Or is it something that would be difficult to scale um, from the onset? Um, and then platform considerations as well. So of course we can't ignore the fact that platforms are ultimately where are hosting the conversations and where a lot of this divisive and harmful dialogue is happening. So really wanted to take into account how would the platforms react to this, right? Would there be cooperation? Are there complexities? Would there be a benefit to platforms? Would they look to partner? Um, so some of those are some of the things that wanted to take into account as we were assessing each of these interventions. Um, and kind of the one you can think of as the lower end of just across each of the categories, more difficult or not as easy, whereas five more favorable, uh, those are things that are, would be scored high across each category. All right, so to go into the interventions themselves, I will talk through six um, interventions that um, came up with. Of course, once again, I will say this was done in collaboration with a lot of different folks. Um, so I'm presenting a lot of work and ideas that have come through a lot of different research conversations. And as I mentioned, so much, so much work that has been done in the area for, for quite a long time. So the first intervention I titled as online identity protection training. Um, and what this encompasses are programs focused on digital literacy, social media management, and privacy advocacy services tailored to journalists. And so really what this intervention is really doing is it's aiming to strengthen the resilience um, for journalists against online harassment. It sort of acknowledges that this problem is inevitable in the world that we live in and is making sure that we better equip journalists with the ways to uh, proactively manage their online identities and reduce their susceptibility to various affair forms of harassment that can go beyond online forms. Um, so things um, like doxing or even like physical threats that happen. Um, and just want to make sure that we amplify a lot of the strategies and tools in existence, right? So there's a lot of work that's happening in this space. There's a lot of tools already, but not oftentimes that can be very expensive for journalists that are just looking to break into the scene. Um, oftentimes there's not great awareness around a lot of these things. And so, you know, this sort of intervention is really aiming to amplify the tools and work of a lot of other bodies. Um, and some of the sort of features that would be involved here are really thinking about, you know, digital literacy workshops, you know, how can we educate journalists on better social media management, um, you know, making sure that they protect some of their sensitive information, you know, like a phone number, like an email and whatnot. Um, also a lot of just, you know, privacy advocacy series as well. So, you know, how can journalists be in a better position to advocate for themselves, um, you know, as they're releasing work and making sure that, you know, their private identity is, is, is kept on locking key. Um, and of course, community support, right, is another sort of thing that would be embedded in this type of intervention, making sure that um, there is a bit of a community support element around this, such that journalists can share best practices with how they've dealt with it, you know, and often sort of find allies in the space. Um, and specifically, I think some of the, the method that's sort of addressed here is really increasing the resources and tools available uh, to journalists. And the challenges addressed specifically are the lack of awareness. So as I mentioned, there are a lot, there's a lot in this space that oftentimes doesn't get amplified. And, you know, a journalist that may not be working for the most prominent platform may not be aware of the breadth of tools out there. Um, and then I think also this takes the reliability off the platforms um, and puts sort of the, puts a sort of empowers the journalists to sort of take a lot of this action into their own hands and thinking about how, you know, they can sort of govern and protect their own identities online. So that's kind of a summary of what this intervention encompasses. In terms of the exact sort of scoring, in terms of potential for impact, um, ultimately graded this sort of a four out of five in that it can have a widespread impact given that a lot of the onus is really um, on the journalists themselves to sort of do this work, but it's giving them the resources, giving them the tools and hopefully lowering sort of the bar of uh, the barrier to entry for this type of knowledge and information. Uh, feasibility is quite high um, as there has been a lot of work done in the space, a lot of organizations just looking for further amplification of the work. 
um, resource requirements were sort of in the middle and it's more around a lot of collaboration, a lot of partnerships efforts, a lot of amplification of this, inf of this information and sort of creating um, a kind of a directory or resource for where a lot of it can be found. Um, time to implement, of course, these things take time and making sure to um, amplify the right resources to make sure the content is helpful, to make sure it can be accessible. And so um, in terms of time to implement, it was graded a little bit lower on that point. Um, scalability, quite high, especially if this is done in a digital means, there could be a way that this would reach a lot of journalists and also not make it so that only more prominent journalists or folks working for more prominent newsrooms would have this type of sort of protection. Um, and platform considerations graded this very high. Um, platforms have been known in the past to partner um, with institutions that are doing this type of work. Um, of course, it doesn't put a lot of business on them to implement specific things in their platform or to, um, you know, sort of take on specific technical projects. So oftentimes platforms are quite supportive of things like this and oftentimes have provided funding in the past or been willing to partner for initiatives focused on better protecting journalists generally. Awesome. The next um, intervention that was detailed sort of in the action plan was titled harassment manager and resource harassment management and resource hub. Um, and this is quite this is a very, very special one for me in that this is a lot of the work that I uh, did at Jigsaw and I hope you know kind of continues um, on in, in different avenues and forums. Um, so what this would be would be some sort of a centralized tool and resource hub designed to help journalists manage online harassment and connect them to supportive communities and resources. Um, and once again, this would be focused specifically on journalists with the aim to increase resources and tools. And it uh, generally would address just the challenges of lack of awareness around what can be done, um, hopefully address some challenges around high cost and uneven deployment. So you know, folks, only certain journalists getting access to certain things. Um, and then, of course, the reliability on platforms, hoping that this can be something built on top of platforms or built uh, like in parallel with platforms to manage some of the harassment that happens. Um, what this would look like was just kind of combining technical tools to help folks sort of better um, do sort of automated her, um, management of their harassment. So that would involve tracking incidents that are happening across their various social platforms and also reporting on some of those incidents. Uh, so if, for example, someone is facing a particular, you know, incident on, you know, X or I guess formerly Twitter, you would, um, like the tool could potentially, you know, help with some of that tracking. Um, it would also be a resource library, so amplifying a lot of the things that folks can do, a lot of the other tools that exist in this space, um, and of course the community connections as well. So, you know, there are a lot of folks doing work in this space. There are a lot of different channels that some of the platforms do provide, and so, you know, giving journalists accessibility to some of those things would also be one of the aims there. Um, and this would also do a lot around mental health resources as well and making sure there is some professional networks as well as support groups for journalists that are facing these problems on the day, on day to day. Um, and now to kind of speak into the grading specifically. Um, so kind of the potential for impact for this one is also very, very high in that it could be a digital tool um, that is you know, readily accessible and available for a lot of different journalists. Um, the feasibility here also quite high. Uh, there are, it is possible to build this technology. Um, a lot of the work that I did at Jigsaw with harassment manager pro has pro proven that this technology is possible to build. Um, I know there are a lot of other folks working in this space. Um, you know, Privacy Party, for example, is another um, sort of tool in this space that can help specifically around the privacy on your accounts. Um, so the technology is possible. Um, and so that's why it's given a sort of a high score there on the feasibility. Um, it's given very low on the resource requirements because um, one thing here is when hosting this sort of technical platform, it can take extensive resources to build and maintain this sort of tool and this sort of resource hub generally and making sure it's consistently up to date, accessible and you know working well and efficiently. Um, time to implement also received a lower score here in that um, with all technical tools, it can take a lot of time, potentially with different partnerships and collaborations that would be required as well. That could take 
you know, upwards of a year or more to sort of completely deploy this sort of tool. Um, scalability scored very highly on scalability, given that, you know, if it is something that can be deployed digitally, there is an opportunity to make sure that there is um, access to a wide range of journalists across different jurisdictions. And on the platform considerations, Mark, this is a bit lower on platform considerations. Um, as folks may know who have worked in this space, the platform relationship and the platform support can be a challenging one, specifically around tools that are built on top of APIs or things like things like that generally. So, you know, I think getting platform cooperation can sometimes be challenging, especially if there is a requirement to get API access or if there's a requirement for some sort of technical work to be done on their side, which is why it was scored lower on the platform consideration side as well. Um, also, with some of these automated tools, they can also better, they can show some of the things that are happening on the platform side in a faster way. And so oftentimes platforms don't love amplifying the harmful things that happen on their sites. Um, and so overall, uh, kind of this specific intervention kind of came in just a little bit under the three point mark. Um, so still quite effective, still quite important, um, but of course can come with the challenges that I mentioned. All right. On to the third intervention addressed in the action plan, it is mindfulness training. Um, so these are efforts uh, specifically aimed at individuals and online users to just be more conscious of how their online behavior affects other people. Um, and this can include different sort of like text box solutions. It can include um, workshops and online campaigns to sort of raise awareness and to hopefully help us rethink how we engage online as everyday people. Um, and so these interventions specifically and programs that roll through this would be really thinking about cultivating a more conscious and respectful online culture. Um, there is oftentimes people have a different bar for how they engage online than how they would engage in person. So we oftentimes see people saying things that they would never say um, in person online and just typing and typing really harmful and hateful content. And so it's really forcing folks to rethink how they speak and engage and hopefully take a second to pause and think about the harmful effects um, that it could potentially have and to recognize that there is someone on the other side of that message. Um, and um, these are trainings that can be done through interactive workshops, um, interactive modules that are built right into specific platforms and just thinking about continuous engagement activities of how can we just nudge different behavior from everyday users. Um, so I mentioned the group here is definitely focused on online users, so not specifically on the journalists themselves. Um, the method here is really thinking about the systemic causes of online harassment and, and what's and how how it from the root where is it starting and the challenge here specifically is just raising self-awareness for the impact of online harassment because what you'll come to find out is that a lot of people behind some of these online attacks don't fully recognize the impact of their words um, and oftentimes don't really intend to inflict the harm that they ultimately do in some cases that may not be the case but oftentimes you'll 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 find that people their in-person identity doesn't often mirror their online identity one-to-one. -one. Um, now, in terms of grading this intervention, uh, the potential for impact for this one was graded on the lower side. Now, the reason the potential for impact is low here is that things that address systemic causes are really, really difficult right, to um, measure. They're often really, really difficult to um, scale and they're often difficult to sort of see the impact of that work happening, right? Um, we oftentimes, it's hard to tell when the behavior is being changed. Um, so that's kind of why the potential to impact is quite low on this one. Um, for feasibility, it's very high. Um, you know, there aren't barriers to doing a lot, doing this type of work. There's a lot of folks that have done a lot of research and extensive work in this area. Um, so resource requirements kind of in the middle. Uh, there's a lot of existing literature, existing technology, and um, in terms of the cost and time, it's sort of reasonable in rolling out these types of programs. Um, time to implement a little bit on the higher end um, in terms of a lower score, just given that it'll take some time to sort of roll these things out, it, making sure the content is as impactful as it can be, and making sure that we're tailoring things for specific audiences. 
um, scalability here is quite difficult. So not so much that the intervention itself can't be scaled. Um, I think the difficulty here is sort of having the means to scale it and being able to justify it being scaled, right? So I think something about mindfulness training that is hard to oftentimes measure the impact, as I mentioned in before. And once you can't measure the impact, it gets difficult to then justify scaling an initiative of this sort. Um, and then platform considerations kind of in the middle. Um, oftentimes, um, platforms can be fairly cooperative for things that sort of involve helping people to rethink, um, especially sort of with the constraints that they don't have to get involved in the capacity of sort of changing um, their technology or, you know, changing the platform as is. So I think that was um, some of the discussion on mindfulness, mindfulness training. Um, the fourth intervention we called Trust and Safety Ambassadors Program. And so this specifically would enlist everyday people as volunteers to enforce community standards and promote better dialogue across platforms. Um, so this intervention is aimed at online users, once again, looking at the systemic causes in terms of how do we sort of nudge people to behave a different way and to engage online in a different way. Um, and then of course the challenges around just self-awareness um, and of course not relying on platforms. One thing that we know generally about online platforms is that um, they face a, a huge burden to moderate their sites um, just in terms of the volume of, of conversations that are happening online, right? And so what this initiative is aiming to do is almost support platforms and creating enlisting everyday people to sort of serve as maybe a first line for some of the things that are happening and to nudge more sort of, um, yeah, to nudge sort of community participation in some of the things that happen online. So it's really thinking through how do we foster a more respectful online environment through community driven enforcement and advocacy. Um, and also how do we kind of create community and training around being an ambassador. So imagine a world in which, you know, you see something online and you sort of intervene in that setting and say, hey, you know, that was a very, very harmful comment. There could have been a better way to express your views or, you know, you didn't need to attack the person's identity. Um, and so this would involve a lot of recruiting the volunteers, um, training them, you know, specifically enforcement and advocacy and, and sort of how that would work sort of in line with the platforms. And then, of course, the community benefits of being an ambassador and being in this program. Now, in terms of grading, you know, when we're kind of taking a deeper look at how this could scale and how this could roll out, potential for impact, again, was graded on the lower side, just because, as I mentioned before, systemic interventions are very, very hard to gauge impact and to oftentimes attribute the impact to that specific intervention. Um, feasibility here is sort of in the middle, so not as um, high as mindfulness training, for example, uh, specifically because rolling out these types of programs and initiatives are really, really difficult, right? Um, if you just take, I don't know, Instagram, for example, rolling out a program like this could be quite difficult in just um, of course, maintaining the community of ambassadors, training the ambassadors, making sure that there's no like infiltration of the ambassadors program. Um, so there could be a lot of potential challenges around feasibility. Then um, sort of resource requirements was in the middle. Um, of course, there would be some funding and resources needed, but that would be sort of reasonable. Time to implement also sort of reasonable um, here in, in sort of creating this program and sort of creating the foundation for it. And I think that the real challenge would be, of course, the impact, making sure the program was scalable and reachable. Um, and I already kind of tied to the next one, scalability would be more difficult uh, with this sort of program to just combat the volume of conversations that are happening. So if we all think about just our regular social media use, for example, I imagine each of us sees multiple instances of online harassment every day, right? And so if you think about how this type of program could have meaningful impact, it would have to be at a very, 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 very large scale. And of course, that comes with the challenges around recruiting and creating um, sort of the foundation and program that could match the amount of incidents that are happening. Um, and platform considerations sort of put that in the middle in that um, platforms would be likely to cooperate and, you know, work, you know, on this one. Um, but 
you know, there could be instances where, you know, they could see it as a potential challenge, you know, if there's, if the ambassador program is interfering with some of their own in-house, like moderation schemes um, and processes, for example. Awesome. Um, so the fifth intervention, um, so the second to last one I will talk about is what we titled the cross-platform moderation hub. Um, so this intervention is specifically targeted at the online platforms themselves. And what it would be is a cross-platform reporting and community um, tool for moderation teams designed to help them like identify trends um, and to sort of interact with each other um, and sort of establish universal monitoring of bad actors. Um, and this would basically empower the moderation teams within sort of these different technology companies to more effectively manage harassment and to coordinate sort of responses. So oftentimes what you'll find is that a lot of the hate that's happening, especially when there is a specific inciting incident and a specific dogpiling incident, it tends to happen cross platform. So they tend to target that journalist on every single social media or news outlet that they're on, right? Um, and so you'll start to sort of see that these incidents are oftentimes coordinated across platforms. But the unfortunate thing is platforms will talk to each other. So, you know, they can't say, oh, this is happening or that's happening, or we see a particular bad actor, you know, kind of doing things across a number of different platforms at the same time. And so this would basically create almost a back end technology that would allow them to communicate with each other and would enhance the effectiveness of their moderation efforts through shared insights and collaborative tools. Um, and some of the features that you can imagine here would be like trend analysis. So knowing like, you know, what incidents are happening or, you know, what in particular is causing a lot of like particular uh, hate or issues at the time. Um, a universal monitoring system. So like I mentioned, flagging things that are happening across different platforms. Um, and then of course, just opening dialogue of shared insights. Um, there's the each platform has learned a ton about doing this type of work. And you can imagine a world of, if that was shared knowledge and shared practices, you know, it could really go a long way in combating the issues that we see online. Um, potential, so moving on to grading, the potential for impact here are very high in that it could be really, really powerful, especially if a lot of the prominent online platforms and different sort of news outlets came together uh, for um, an initiative like this. Um, feasibility, sort of in the middle, um, the technology exists and is possible, but oftentimes it has not, there hasn't been conscious thinking around building something that could be genuinely cross-platform or opening up of the different tools that would allow them to speak to each other. Um, resource requirements, uh, sort of really, really um, low here in that it would be tons of resources required and a lot of collaboration to sort of get different parties in the room to build this, um, which is also why the time to implement could be sort of quite long here in that, um, yeah, I think getting all the folks in the room and then agreeing to sort of start the work could, could be a, quite a cumbersome process. Um, scalability quite high, um, especially if this is sort of done um, from a technological angle, uh, you know, different platforms could be onboarded to sort of make sure that they're, you know, contributing to the specific issues that are happening, as well as sort of sharing best practices and taking in some of the insights that, um, to protect their own platforms. Um, platform considerations here, very, very um, low um, for this particular one in that um, I think, unfortunately, what has been seen is that platforms are oftentimes not often willing to share data with each other. Um, there's a lot of sort of like legal challenges that come up around just sort of the data agreements and sharing agreements that can happen there. Um, and platforms oftentimes are not the most cooperative when you tell them that they need to, you know, sit next to what they may deem as a competitor um, for their for their given space. Um, so I think overall, uh, this was quite a, a solution that could, or an intervention, sorry that could have high potential for impact and for scalability, but definitely more challenging on some of the other uh, measures there. All right, and then the last intervention that I uh, will talk about and that was noted sort of in the action plan was uh, policy advocacy initiatives. Um, and so this is thinking definitely longer term in terms of time to implement. Um, 
but this specifically would be around efforts focused on advocating for policy interventions aimed at mitigating the prevalence and impact of journalist harassment online. So today there's often not great ways to sort of take a legal approach to this um, in terms of if, any, if, if a journalist wanted to potentially pursue um, legal recourse against uh, online perpetrators or, you know, to protect themselves in legal parameters. There's not a lot of frameworks today for online harassment, um, hate speech, a lot of these things, unfortunately, right? The regulatory, I would say, the regulatory view on this space is, is quite behind. Um, and so what this intervention would really be proposing is how do we influence regulatory frameworks that can hold platforms accountable, hold online perpetrators accountable for, you know, addressing um, for the online hate that's happening, the hate speech, um, and how can we ensure consequences for perpetrators? A lot of this, unfortunately, there are no consequences today for some of these actions that take place. And thus, um, it sort of just perpetuates the problem when there is nothing that can honestly be done when things happen to a journalist. Um, so this would really be thinking about, you know, providing avenues for targets of harassment um, and thinking about ways to promote fair and responsible online environments um, and take and through re regulatory measures generally. Um, and this would of course involve um, advocacy campaigns to just raise awareness to make sure that this is at the forefront of you know regulatory conversations. Um, it would involve you know legal framework development, just actually coming up with you know how we should be thinking about these issues, you know and you know, what are the parameters to consider as some of this framework is developed? Um, this would involve stakeholder engagement. So, you know, lobbying different um, regulatory bodies, sort of different um, lawmakers and officials um, thinking through how we can raise awareness for this and sort of bring them as allies into this space and thinking about these issues from a legal framework mindset. Um, and then of course, accountability around sort of the platform involvement and the platform um, sort of responsibility in better managing some of these things. So, you know, can we mandate open API access, you know, across different online platforms? So tools can be built um, on the data of these platforms, for example, for the sake of managing harassment and to, you know, help with online protection or privacy and advocacy um, generally. Um, so those are some of the things that would be involved in sort of this breadth of work uh, for this intervention. Now, in terms of grading it, I think this was kind of one where it, it was a lot of things sort of in the middle. So I think potential for impact here, kind of in the middle. Um, I think every time you sort of approach things from a legal or reg regulatory framework, there is one thing with the institution of, of these things, uh, and there's oftentimes another challenge with the enforcement. Um, so kind of potential for impact there sort of in the middle and that there's kind of a two edged sword here with with not only fighting for sort of this legislature to legislation to happen, but then, of course, the enforcement of it and how it rolls out in different jurisdictions. Um, feasibility um, in the middle here, as I mentioned, can be oftentimes very, very difficult to get the buy in support needed for sort of these types of initiatives generally. Um, resource requirements quite low on this, just in terms of a lot of resources would be required, especially around sort of, you know, raising awareness for this campaigns to um, get the right folks in the room and to sort of raise the right awareness around some of these issues to make it at the forefront um, of like regulatory discussions and debates. Um, and then time to implement very, very low here. This is a very, very long term <laughs> Um, intervention and a difficult one. I think anyone that is, you know, remotely involved in this space can just imagine how long it could take to get um, a bill passed of some sort that would force social media platforms to open APIs. Um, that would be, you know, that could take years. Um, on the scalability side, um, kind of mark this one as lower on the scalability side, mainly because of just the way um, jurisdictions come into place. So you might be able to lobby for something to done in a particular state, but, you know, it may not be able to be done in a different state. And there's a whole lot of challenges that come with that. Um, and then platform considerations put this also quite low for the platform considerations in that oftentimes they've been quite against things that force additional responsibility and accountability on them around some of these issues. Um, so they've often not been very cooperative with 
these types of interventions specifically in the online harassment space. Awesome, and so those were the six interventions covered in the action plan. And so I will just jump to conclusion and then open it up for Q&A. All right, so in terms of the sort of conclusion I had in drafting and talking through all of these interventions, the ultimate thing that if I can say is pursuing multiple interventions simultaneously would be best. So I know there's a lot of work that's happening across a number of these interventions already. And so um, thinking of them almost kind of together and kind of attacking different vectors and the problem and different approaches is really the way forward to make sure that we're maximizing the impact of this work. Um, and so I just say through you know, strong collaboration and strategic implementation, we can achieve significant and lasting impact in combating journalist harassment online. Awesome. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Anasola. Um, you are all welcome to submit questions in the Q&A section or raise your hand and we'll call on you. Um, it looks like we have a couple questions in the Q&A section already. So um, our first question is, what was the greatest surprise to you that you discovered while building out these standards and recommendations? Uh, where are the biggest barriers to uptake, such as funding, political will, awareness, technical implement implementation? Ooh, um, that's a great one. So I think what was the greatest surprise? Um, um, I think the greatest surprise, and I think one thing that is, um, I would say, a, a more positive note when sort of doing work in this space or thinking about this space is there is a ton of action happening. So, you know, I think oftentimes it's it's a bit of a, you're, you feel like you're almost running uphill because online harassment is just so pervasive and you know oftentimes the amount of action attention and support is not matching just how challenging a problem it is but i think one thing that's surprising to me is always just seeing the new technology the new initiatives the the additional work that is happening in the space and it's almost i think a pleasant surprise um and then i think on the what are the biggest sort of barriers to uptake um i think it depends on some of the interventions i would say a big barrier generally is funding like i think um oftentimes a lot of these interventions are just are, are quite expensive right and you know require technical teams they require you know potentially like manpower on ground to you know kind of roll out a lot of these initiatives they require um strong uh i guess collaboration right with different partners so I think those can definitely be some of the biggest barriers. So I would definitely say I think funding. Um, and then I would call it more of like a willingness, right? I think there needs to be a collective willingness with all the powers at be to tackle some of these problems. And even in my time at Jigsaw and then doing some of this work with ASML, I think you, the willingness was oftentimes not there. Um, I, I think that on the technical implementation side, a lot of this technology exists, right? Some of the technology that's being built is you know, making these problems more worse, honestly, right? They're sort of, you know, yeah, we could, I won't go into too much there. So the technology exists to, to combat this and it's more the willingness, the funding and, you know, really kind of creating collective um, action around the work. And we have a question here going off of your experience in FinTech. Are there any initiatives from your experience in FinTech that could be used to assist with these online harassment issues? Yeah, that's a really <laughs> interesting one. I've never thought about um, the bridge of the two. Are there any issues? Um, hmm. That's a really, really good one that I would honestly need to like think more about. Um, honestly, nothing that immediately comes to mind, right? I think, yeah, the financial technology space is, is yeah, is a little removed, I would say, from at least online harassment in the form of like conversation and like dialogue that's happening online. Um, 
but I, I think generally every, like no matter what is happening. Yeah. I would say no matter like the adjacency to like forms of online harassment, I think it's really important that everyone sort of be an ally and an advocate for additional work to be done in that area. I think no matter what you work in day to day, like you can't, it's hard to deny the prevalence of online harassment, right? Like you see it, I see it. Even if you're not a journalist, you can open your Instagram, open whatever right now and within minutes see an incident of online harassment. And so I do think um, everyone can be an advocate, everyone can be an ally, everyone can you know, look for ways to support um, the important work that's being done. Great, we have um, Elodie raising her hand. Um, I will, oh, go ahead, Elodie. Oh, yes, does it work? Thank you. Uh, I just want to, so first of all, thank you so much, uh, Adisola, because um, I have to say I've, I'm a I'm a journalist. I collaborate with civil society organizations supporting journalists uh, harassed online. And a few years ago, I've been part of these consultations with uh, Jigsaw on the harassment ma management uh, tool. And it's very, it's incredibly helpful for journalists, of course. But unfortunately, I have the same, um, I would say, um, conclusion uh, when you mentioned the, the lack of willingness, funding. And I would say at a time where we need absolutely the opposite, uh, because we have a rise of digital authoritarianism worldwide. And um, I, I was just a few minutes just before joining your uh, your, con your, your, your talk um, to a training with, with um, a journalist and uh, in France, in my country, currently we we see on social media a list of journalists to to kill circulating um, and shared by uh, extremist group, and uh, and this is the the kind of things it's very difficult to take action on that, and um, and my question is um, how can we create incentives uh, for uh, online platforms to. Um, take action on these things because it's a huge threat for freedom of expression of journalists, for their safety, but also for our democratic processes. And um, last year, I was a RSM fellow at uh, BKC working on escalation channels with social media platforms, um, workflow between civil society organizations and platforms um, uh, during crises. Um, I hope you, you've mentioned the regulation and I have some hopes regarding the DSA, the Digital Services Act in Europe, uh, European Union. Um, some articles like articles on trusted flaggers, articles on crisis mechanism. Can it create some traction, some incentives for the platforms? We try to, as civil society organizations, we try to engage on these things. But it's incredibly difficult. And I have a lot of conversations also with platforms on this issue. The the system, when it comes to harassment, it's super complicated because as you described, and it's it's, it's amazing to have all your uh, this framework because it it come it's about feature, it's about content moderation, it's about debunking inauthentic coordinated behaviors online. So, what kind of incentives can we create uh, for the platforms to take action in this very complex? Uh, framework. And thank you so much again for this talk and, and your action in the field and your work in the field. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I do even remember some of our previous chats and engagements um, with the harassment manager during my time at Jigsaw. Um, no, I think you ask, I think just a burning question for everyone sort of doing work in this space is like, what can we do to raise the incentives? Um, you know, I think my opinion definitely is that I think you raise incentives when you sort of force uh, platforms to take just more accountability and and yeah, to take more accountability for the management of the of the harassment that's happening on their platforms. And I think unfortunately, a lot of that work is more of a long term play around some of the policy advocacy initiatives I spoke about. Um, but I think while a lot of those things take time to, you know, come into fruition, I do think there is a lot of work around just continuing to um, amplify like the bodies and the different organizations that are doing this work sort of independent of the platforms. And then I think also, you know, with 
the supporters at these different sort of online platforms and technology companies, you know, working as closely as you can with them um, to sort of, yeah, combat a lot of the harassment that's taking place. And then I will say to um, one of the big learnings, I think, from Jigsaw is that oftentimes some of the most popular platforms are not your are not the most cooperative or collaborative, but there are a lot of different sort of like newsrooms and different and other online platforms that are sort of gaining popularity and prominence that do have sort of different outlook on a lot of these things and, you know, really want to be mindful of, you know, how they're, how the social spaces they're creating are, you know, making these issues worse, right? So I do think there are, not all online platforms are uncooperative. And so really working with folks that are sort of ready and hungry to do that work and then sort of creating additional buying and incentives over time. Thank you so much. Great, we have um, another hand raised. Oh, Nana. Am I muted now, I think? Yep, you're good. Perfect. Thank you so much for your talk, Adesola, and for all the research you've done over the last few weeks. And it was really fascinating to see how this intersected with the work you did when you were at Google as well. Um, I was super fascinated by the intervention you talked about with the cross-platform moderation hub. Um, you know, sometimes harassment will stem from one platform, but then once the bad actor kind of knows of this person, it'll come from all different angles and all different platforms. So like you were mentioning, having that collaboration or communication between platforms is super valuable. I'm curious about the feasibility of this, though, because platforms are different in the sense where some require verification and you'd use your actual identity and others where you can have different personas. So I think that discrepancy would make it really challenging to be able to identify like who are, like, who are you and how are you represented on different platforms so that we can actually stop that harassment. And I was wondering if you thought of this and potential interventions um, or ways to address that. Yeah, so the feasibility of this one is definitely like difficult um, and definitely scaling. This one is definitely challenging because as you mentioned, like different platforms have different parameters for and like even different ways users are registered, different community guidelines, all sorts, right? So it's definitely a difficult one in terms of both the on the feasibility and scalability side. Um, but I think it often it just starts with sort of thinking critically about like what are some of the yeah, I guess what are some of the overlaps across different forums and like what are the information and, and insights that would be helpful for their specific moderation teams, right? So uh, you can think of it as like, okay, you know, even if, you know, different, yeah, even if different platforms have anonymous users and whatnot, it would be helpful for platforms to just understand like what are trending hate topics or what are trending hate discussions that are happening across different sites, right? Like that's just a helpful piece of information to know. So I do think there is some low hanging fruit like in a cross-platform world, um, but to your point, to become to get really sophisticated, where you know there's automated actions being taken, and you know, sort of a very open data sharing world. I think, yeah, that's a very, very, I think, difficult road to take. Um, but I do think there's definitely low hanging fruit in terms of like what information is just helpful across different platforms, and you know, what insights would be helpful to their moderation teams to better action on different things that are happening. Thank you. I'm gonna head back into the Q&A section. We have a question from Joseph. Um, this is on the point of interventions versus solutions. What are your thoughts about what we can learn from instances of harassment where both the journalists targeted and those targeting them are fully aware of the tactics at play thinking about reporters who are experts on social media plat on how social media platforms work and are nonetheless silenced on these platforms to various degrees. But another way, what do you make of how efforts to counter online harassment have been falling short so far and now face an environment where social media platforms, IG, Twitter, Meta, have generally become less interested in mitigating these harms? Yeah, no, I think ugh, this is a very, very tough one. Um, and I think that's sort of ultimately at the end why I advocated for a number of these interventions sort of working together, right? So in certain instances and on certain platforms um, and harassment management, you know, resource might be the way to go, right? Because maybe there's like open API access for that specific platform and there's ability to build tooling on top of it. 
Whereas, you know, in other, in other social media platforms, maybe there's more lenient um, privacy or I guess more a stronger control on privacy settings in specific platforms. So you can almost better protect yourself. Like, you know, you can lock down your DMs, you can, you know, cover certain pieces of information, you can restrict comments. Like some platforms do have additional actions that you can take. Um, so I think to your point, there is, unfortunately, it is a, a tough environment. I would say, you know, even during my time working in this space, unfortunately, you know, there's sometimes been, it seems like a waning willingness to do some of the work in a, in this area, especially from the platform side, especially around some of the most prominent platforms, frankly. Um, but I do think taking a lot of these interventions together and thinking through not just, okay, you know, the platforms that we all think of, but, you know, thinking through just, yeah, the different array of online forums that exist online and starting somewhere, I think you can often inspire action um, and inspire more awareness such that there could be, for example, policy initiatives that force more accountability for those larger platforms like a meta, uh, for instance. Right, and we are over time. Uh, so I just wanna recognize that, but um, this event is being recorded and will be posted online. And I think Adesol, if you have time, maybe we can wrap up with one more question. Yes, yes, happy to take one more question. Awesome, great. So we have a question in the Q&A from Marcos. Uh, thanks for an inspiring presentation. My question is, how can we teach those implementations in class? I have a professor of journalism and I was wondering what would be a good assignment to teach students how to combat online harassment. Yeah, so I think, so it's hard for me to answer this with like a very specific thing, but there, I would say there are quite a lot of folks doing work in sort of the mindfulness training world and thinking through like, how do we, even from a younger age, um, specifically just get people to be more cognizant of like how their online behavior has real world impact. Um, and so there are, um, there's a lot of research on it specifically around like interactive modules, different workshops um, that can, you know, um, that can just, you know, force people to kind of think through how they, what they type online can harm others. Um, and so it's hard for me to name a specific thing, but I will uh, say that like there's a lot of research, a lot of literature. I imagine even as some of this work continues through AS ASML, there will be an opportunity to, I think, share more broadly, like the different resources that folks can tap into for that specific type of intervention. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you again, Adesola, for sharing these interventions and your work. Um, and thank you all for joining us this, this afternoon uh, for the presentation. Um, and we encourage you to continue to follow the work coming out of ASML. Um, and Adesola's um, write up on, on the research that she's done and these interventions. Um, and yeah, uh, very much appreciate your time and spending more time with us, uh, a little extra. Um, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for attending.